We've done the 2010s, we conquered the 2000s, and we destroyed the 90s, and now we are back to go into the fucking 80s. Yes. Our top 10 favorite films of the 1980s. My list, Austin's list. Count it down. You know the drill. This is Filmgasm. All right. The 80s. So, oh man. Maybe my favorite decade of film. As making yeah. while I was making this, I realized, yeah, this is mine. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've thought a lot about that as we've done these because this is now our fourth fourth part of what would be a, kind of a five-part series because the 60s, you and I both have agreed that we have more work to do. Yes. More things to watch. I'm not saying it'd be hard to come up with 10, but it'd be hard to come to a place where I'm making cuts. Yeah. And that's where I've been with all these other decades. The 2010s, I'm like, oh my God, I cut inside Lewin Davis. What am I doing? Or The Master, what am I doing? And then the 2000s, same thing. You know, I had to cut out Lord of the Rings. What am I doing? You know, like I love the Two Towers. I love Return of the King. And then 90s, same shit. I cut out Reservoir Dogs, you know? It goes so on and so forth. 60s, I don't feel that way yet. Yeah. Um, you know, we're only 25. <laughs> we have some work to do, but I mean, man, yeah, the 80s, I know this is your, oh, this is your jam because culture, this is your culture. Yeah. Um, I love some movies from this decade, but it is, it is definitely not my favorite because I don't connect to those, those movies like you do. I know we're going to get into some of them. It's going to be a lot of fun. Nearly um, every film on my top 10 is something I grew up with. Okay, there you go. It's, That's what I was yeah. getting around to, basically. These are my introduction to film movies. These are my childhood favorites. These are my lifetime favorites. Yeah, and all 10 of mine, I actually don't think I saw any of them until I was 13, 12, 13. Wow. Well, a couple of them, yeah, I definitely saw when I was like, you know, 11, 12, 13. But most of these are like, you know, when I was like 17, 18, you know, when I first wow. saw them. Yeah. <laughs> so I did not, these are more movies that I heard about, went back and watched. I was like, wow, that's stellar stuff. Uh, so this is going to be very interesting. I For think sure. we're going to have a lot of differences, but some similarities because you were allowed to see more shit than I was <laughs> as a kid, it, it, mainly horror. Yeah. And 80s has some, obviously some legendary horror oh, films. I've got some good shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm excited. So we, we've usually done it this way. We've usually done, um, I would go first so that you can finish off. So I'll start off with my 10. I don't know if you're going to have it, but I know you love it. Steven Spielberg, I think it's his third best movie ever. Be Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, shit. 1981. <laughs> Overlap. Overlap? Where do you have it? <laughs> that is my no number two. Number two? <laughs> Raiders, Raiders is, is two. my number two. Fuck yeah. So this is, this would be the one that I saw earliest of all of these. Okay. I saw this when I was 11 or 12. Yeah. And just it has not left my mind. Oh, no. Some of the fucking best action sequences ever. Still to this day, fuck Crystal Skull. One of the best uh, trilogies of all time. I mean, 81 to 84 to 89. I think you might have a couple of the other ones. <laughs> I don't, but it was tough. So so this is the one you chose. Yeah. I think this is the best two. Oh my God. The Last Crusade. I know. <laughs> Temple of Doom. They yeah. all have something unbelievable to offer. Unbelievable. But this is, I don't know. This introduction is so strong. And again, some of the action sequences are like, ooh, like some of the best shit I've ever seen in my life. And Spielberg, I'll stand by all day. You know, I think I think Jurassic Park and Jaws are his two un- Question masterpieces, and I think it's his Indiana Jones trilogy after that. It's just amazing shit. So I'll let you kind of take it away. That's your number two, man. <laughs> so Raiders has always been a very special movie to me. Uh, all three of them have. Yeah. Some of the earliest uh, action films I ever watched. I, my favorite as a kid was Temple of Doom. I would watch that repeatedly, and which is weird because that's kind of the scariest one. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> and. Uh, Raiders and Last Crusade, I hold on equal ground, but I had to pick one. And it's the original, it's the beginning. It's for me, it's the film that made Harrison Ford a badass. Not Star yeah. Wars. Uh, oh Indiana yeah. Jones. Oh yeah. And it was almost Tom Selleck, too. I can't believe that. Thank God for Magnum P.I. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, for me, the scene that always stands out is the opening of the arc. Yeah. That still looks incredible and is horrifying, even now. Yeah. That's incredible to make makeup effects that last 40 years. Way to go. I think I would say it's Spielberg's best movie. So you like it better than Hell Yeah? I think I do. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I just think, I, I, I find Jaws and Jurassic Park to be just these. Those are undisputed and, and masterpieces. I love fucking monster movies so much that yeah. when, anytime there's a giant, giant thing attacking people and it's actually a good movie, oh man, I'm in. You know? True, but Raiders I know, is I know. like... <laughs> On a completely different level. There's a reason we both have it. Yeah. I, it's, yeah, it's stellar, <laughs> stellar stuff. What a way to start 
Uh, that was your number two. So I guess we'll go to your number 10. Okay. My number 10 is the film that made Tim Burton a household name, 1988's Beetlejuice. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Two, like a lovable couple, two kind of, I don't want to say yuppies, but clueless do people. They die. They end up as ghosts in their own house. And this family of these guys are the yuppies. These New York assholes move into their house gut the place, make it their own. And so these ghosts hire a bio exorcist to get them out of their house. And this bio exorcist is this undead dickhead named Beetlejuice. The greatest performance Michael Keaton has ever given, the most entertaining character Tim Burton ever created, and a fucking hilarious movie Yes, that is really weird, but the quintessential Burton. And is totally in the book of filmgasm. Without a doubt. It's in there. You'll see it in the future. It, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. It, extremely good stuff. I know we were both huge Keaton fans. Yes. He's just, in, in my eyes, he's just like a legend. He always will be. And I love today, like I love his, his like activity and the politics and stuff. He's just hilarious. He cracks me up and he's always played these wonderful, wonderful characters from this to Batman to Birdman, you know, just in spotlight. You know, he's awesome. He's awesome. He's fantastic. It's a great choice. <laughs> my favorite thing about Beetlejuice is that I've been watching it since I was a kid. Yeah. And it's really hard to sell to people because it's the weirdest. Describing it is, right. you, you sound like a maniac. Yeah, you kind of <laughs> need to see it as a kid to, yeah, to be with it because, yeah. <laughs> but you've got, you know, along with Michael Keaton, you've got Gina Davis, Alec Baldwin, Jeffrey Jones, Catherine O'Hara, Winona Ryder, Sylvia Sidney. Just an incredible cast yeah. of Burton mainstays. And they all, I think almost all of those guys would work with him later. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the role that got Keaton the role of Batman. I would agree. And yeah, it's just, it's a Halloween staple for me. I watch it every year and I adore it. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So we got Raiders, my 10, Beetlejuice. Uh, to my number nine, this is changing up the pace a little bit. I'd uh, be Brian De Palma's 1983 Scarface. Scarface. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> ooh, boy. I, okay, this one I also saw around 12, 13, probably, in my opinion, maybe a little too young to see this movie. Uh, I find it to be still uh, like cringeworthy, so intense at times. Particularly, my favorite scene would be in the bathtub with the chainsaw. Ooh, brutality! You yeah. got the woman on the bed. Really, it's just really strange. Yeah, Brian De Palma is just so good at like constructing these scenes that are like feel like everyone's on drugs, but it's so violent and so scary. Um, this is one of the first things I saw that was revolved around a drug dealer, Tony Montana, and that immediately obviously became fascinating to me, just like everybody. And I think that leads all the way to like our fascination with guys like Walter White or Gus Fring. This is a huge part of pop culture, huge part of the eighties, because a lot of the eighties is very bubbly and poppy and Scarface is not Whew. Scarface is very much like fuck the flower power shit. <laughs> it's all about violence and drugs and cocaine and anger and re you know, revenge and power. Uh, yeah. It's endlessly rewatchable and, you know, Al Pacino. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what else I could say about him. I, it's not my favorite performance by him, but it is the most, like, memorable, you know? It's Tony Montana, you know? Yeah. Uh, obviously, Godfather. You know, I love Serpico. I love stuff in the 70s, but Scarface. I mean, I had a, I had a poster on my wall in high school. It was, a, it was a $100 bill, and I had him in the middle, and who do I trust? I trust me. <laughs> that kind of stuff, you know, you just you just get kind of infatuated with characters like that as a young, like young boy, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of just stayed with me. I would have felt completely wrong leaving this movie off because it, it is one of the first like classic eighties movies I saw. And it remains. Yeah. One of those kind of influential movies in the gangster realm. And obviously that's big in our, you know, we've already done the Godfather on this podcast. We've talked about Al Pacino a lot. And you know, this is Michelle Pfeiffer as well. It's strikingly gorgeous in this movie. And a damn good performance from her. She gets overlooked because she's next to fucking Al Pacino. <laughs> but I, I also think it's really interesting that uh, Don Eladio in Breaking Bad yeah. is, his, is his homeboy in Scarface, is his <laughs> buddy. Really strange because it, <laughs> it's like, oh man, if he hadn't died, you know, <laughs> maybe that's what he would have become. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated by Scarface. Some of the set pieces are awesome. The costume design is fantastic. Uh, production design, all that stuff is like great A. And then it's, and then it's got just ridiculously good quotes ridiculously good you know and tony montana al pacino is the king of giving you that that quick abrupt you know where you remember it for the rest of your life you know and 
and him, you know, firing away, knowing he's going to die, you know, come on. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's amazing. I love Scarface. Uh, I have a hard time believing if people haven't seen it, you know, uh, is it on yours? It's not on mine, no? but it is a fantastic movie. Yeah, it's great, man. Long overdue for a rewatch for me. It's been a while. Yeah, see, this is one I... Yeah, it's always been in my consciousness. It's always been there. It's one of the only 80s movies that I'm like, I know exact everything about it. I know when it came out. Like, I've always known that for the past 12 years. And, of course, some of these movies... Like, some of the movies we'll talk about have surpassed it because I've just grown up and watched them more. But Scarface is just always going to be there. Yeah. It's always going to be there. W- whether this is weird or not, but it's kind of like comfort food for me. <laughs> I know it's, like, really fucked up. But, like, one of my really good buddies from middle school, Arnold Adame, and his brother, Jacob Adame... We would watch this movie all the time together, us three, and quote all the time and talk in the accent, you know, I kill these cockroaches, you know, and it was so much fun. It was just, I'll always have fond memories of this movie and I'll continue to watch it till the day I die. That's for sure. Fuck yeah, man. That's awesome. Scarface. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My number nine is the second film by Joel and Ethan Cohen, 1987's Raising Arizona. Overlap! <laughs> Not too bad. That's my number seven. Oh, all right. Cool. <laughs> Take it away. Raising Arizona is Nicolas Cage's greatest performance. It's one of the funniest films ever made. Yes. And another film that's really hard to explain to people who haven't seen it. Yes. Childless couple kidnap a baby, and it's hilarious. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, you got to see it. Yeah. It's just, it's the film that showed the Coen brothers not only could do incredible drama like they did with Blood Simple, but yeah. they could do hilarious comedy. They would later show off again with the Big Lebowski and well, Old Brother Where Art Thou. Well, H.I. is the precursor. Yeah. To the dude. He's the proto-dude. Yeah. And people <laughs> don't fucking give him that respect. If the dude was married, this is what he would be. <laughs> oh. uh, John Goodman. Come John on. Goodman's fucking hilarious. <laughs> Holly Hunter does a great job. You've got... I love it, her... Uh, I think her cousins or her sister or work friend or whoever. <laughs> Glenn shows up. And come on. Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> T-I-G-E-R. Like, that whole thing. Dude, some of the best quotes the Coen's ever made. It's, I mean, yeah. My favorite scene, hands down, I think we talked about this in the Coen Brothers episode, is the Huggies. Oh, the, yeah, when he goes to the gas station. Yeah. yeah, come on. Without a doubt. I'll be taking... <laughs> Better hurry it up, I'm a Dutch with the wife. Take the Huggies, whatever cash you got. Yeah. Oh, and him running in the street, at, at, you know. Take a left up here, and she's screaming at it. All that stuff is genius. Yeah. Unbelievable stuff. Yeah, it's... It, how do you explain it to someone who hasn't seen it? I would just be like, Nicky Cage, check it out, you know? Yeah. 80s Nicky Cage. I don't want to say anything else, you know? Yeah. It's tough because you want people to be surprised. But yes. <laughs> people in the movie scene, they know, they've known this movie for years. This is a celebrated cult hit. Oh, and yeah. Endlessly rewatchable. I could put it on right now, and then when it's over, watch it all over again. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, fantastic film. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's my number, my number seven. I... I even wrote a top five, you know, Cohen movies. This is my number four. Yeah. You know, yeah, I adore everything about Freezing Arizona. There's what's right and there's what's right. Never the twain, twain shall, shall meet. meet. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is, yeah. It's it's a it's a, a average Joe's movie, you know. It's, oh, it's, yeah. It's for the people. And yeah, <laughs> absolutely hilarious. To me, the funniest movie from the 80s. I know you probably have something to say about that, but that's that's my opinion. Anyway. I agree with you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I think right. that is the funniest movie that's of the fantastic. 80s. fantastic. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, so your 10, give me your 10 again. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, and your nine is? Raising Arizona. Okay, and so I got Raiders, Scarface, and then Arizona's my seven. So we'll go to my eight. Okay. Uh, my number eight is actually my only best picture winner. I imagine oh. you don't have any. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, it'd be 1984's Amadeus. Really? Yeah. Wow. I never get to talk about this movie. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> um, so I saw Amadeus for the first time because I was... Uh, in 2016, because in 2016 is when I first saw Magnolia, first got into some directors like Paul Thomas Anderson and Wes Anderson, and I just kind of got, you know, obsessed with American cinema, and I wanted to see all the Best Picture winners, and Amadeus is one I found at Best Buy on DVD, and I was like, I was like, oh, it won, you know, in 84 or whatever, I, I gotta, you know, I gotta see it at least, and I really, really like F. Murray Abraham because of Wes Anderson, so I was like, all right, this, you know, maybe this is for me, maybe it's not, you know, I gotta check it out, oh my god, this movie's for me, oh boy, I... I can't say enough about Amadeus, and I think it's one of the better performances that I know of of the 80s, which F. Murray Abraham. Um, do you, have you seen this movie? Yes. Yeah. I, what do you think about it? What's your relationship with it? Amadeus, I watched it a long time ago when I was like 
nine or 10 years old because I was fascinated with Mozart. Yeah, of course. And I fell in love. I was like, this movie is unbelievable. It was mesmerizing. It's fantastic. I had to convince my mom to let me stay up late to watch it because it was a school night and it's a three hour movie. Yes, it's very long. But I was glued to the screen. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is an incredible tale of jealousy and like intelligent design and just an amazing, talented, like once in a lifetime kind of artist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just what a film. Yeah, and so obviously Amadeus, you know, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's played by Tom Holche, who's not the main character. F. Murray Abraham is, and he's playing another composer, Saleri. And they just have this rivalry that is unbelievable. And I can watch, I love that. We've talked about The Lighthouse. I love when two really good actors are just, just me and you in a room, you know, like, let's yeah. go. Um, uh, you know, Milos Foreman, directed by, we've talked about One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest in the past. This guy's a genius, genius director. And I think Amadeus is my second favorite movie that he's done. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say enough about it. As far as music movies go, this is one of the best, for sure. I, uh, you know, I, as far as like a biopic goes, it's one of my favorite favorites. I, yeah, I can't, I can't say enough about it. Amadeus is awesome. Definitely check it out if you can. It has been way too long since I saw Amadeus. Now I really want to watch it. Again. Amadeus. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic! I was not expecting that. That is, a I welcome it's, surprise. it's not one that comes up a lot, you know. Yeah, it's not like, yeah, it's just not one of those pop culture like staples. It is such a good movie. But it should be. It should it really be. should be. I think it is amongst an older audience. Like, my parents are both obsessed with it, you know? And that's one of the reasons I definitely watch it, too, is I heard them talk about it. But yeah, it's just... I, I've been on this journey to watch all the Best Picture winners for the past, like, four years. And this is just one of the first ones I was able to get a hold of on DVD. I still have it. I'll never give that up. <laughs> never. That's really cool, man. That's an awesome quest. Well, my number eight is one of my all-time favorite horror films, and my January pick for my birthday for this past uh, batch of Filmgasm, 1981's An American Werewolf in London. Number eight. Number eight. I thought this was going to be like three or four. There's other movies, man. The <laughs> 80s was tough for I, me. I, I, know, I think I know what's at the top, and obviously I know what number two is, because everybody does. <laughs> oh, this is great. I yeah. love this. Take American away. Werewolf is, hands down, the greatest werewolf movie ever made. We talked at length about that. Yeah. Back Some of the January. best makeup oh, ever. Yeah. Hands down, still has not been beat. An incredible story of just one man in the wrong place at the wrong time who becomes this creature. And it's played for laughs a lot of the time, but it's also a very scary movie. Yeah, grotesque. Yeah. yeah. From the guy who made the Blues Brothers. I mean, yes. unbelievable. I couldn't say enough about An American Werewolf in London. One of the earliest horror films I ever saw and still to this day, one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, I, I think I've only seen it once because I just did it for the podcast. I think if I saw it again, I might have it closer to here for sure. It is so stellar. I have the utmost respect for that movie and I'm so glad you chose it for for your birthday. Yeah. Because it yeah just kind of changed my view of how good things could, you know, I already love The Carpenter and the practicality of things and this just showed it even further. You know? Oof, yeah. Unbelievable stuff, you know. <laughs> Fantastic pick. Right odd, man. So that brings us to my number seven, which we already know is Raising Arizona. Yes. So my number six, and we'll go to your seven and six. Okay. Ah, speaking of John Carpenter, 1981, Escape from New York. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Is this on yours or no? no? I don't have any Carpenter. What? What? I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, I'm blown away. I had to make cuts. I didn't want to, but I had to, and it hurt. I told you I was struggling for a long okay, time. Okay, this one I'm not as surprised by, but the other one I'm I know. very surprised by. It should How do been. I have it? <laughs> <laughs> you showed it to me, man. I know. You called me out at work, and you were like, what the fuck, man? You haven't seen... <laughs> I won't say it. It hurts, but... Um, yeah. Holy shit. Escape from New York. We got to talk about uh, in length with your uncle, Sean on the podcast a couple months ago. Yeah. One of my favorite episodes we've ever done, uh, which we talked about as well when we did our top five. Didn't we both choose it for a top five? Or did yeah, just we did. That? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that we did. The Escape from New York with Sean. And we're going to hopefully do a podcast with him soon because uh, it was just unbelievable. It was jaw-dropping to watch somebody um, talk about a movie that they know so well and enhanced my love for it because of all the knowledge he knows behind it. Uh, Escape from New York is obviously directed by John Carpenter. And it is one of the most uh, aggressive and it, it just doesn't allow you to think or breathe or be. You're just in it. Oh, yeah. And I love that your your uncle you know, kept pointing out how, how thin the script is and how much of it is based on atmosphere and action. <coughs> and that is just, ah, man, when a movie can do that. We talked about Raiders of Lost Ark. I love some of the action sequences of that, but oh, boy. Escape from New York has, <laughs> has some wonderful stuff in it. 
I, yeah, I don't even know if I could pick a favorite scene. <laughs> I mean, Kurt is just the man the yeah. whole fucking time. The whole time. He's the man. The whole movie is the scene, you know? Uh, yeah, I'm really glad you, you, you really pushed me to watch Carpenter because now, look at this. He's in my... He is another movie that, you know, I have two of his in my top 10. So it's just, this guy's the man. Oh, yeah. He's, he's the, to me, the king of the 80s, in my opinion. I, yeah, I love him. Love his work. And yeah, this is a fantastic movie that people should uh, rewatch if they can, if they haven't seen it in a while. Because I think people kind of mistake it for just like a action movie, you know? It's like, nah, man, it's like got a lot more grit to it. It's everything. It's everything. Yeah. yeah. Check it out again. It's yeah. a badass flick. It definitely deserves a rewatch, yeah, for, for everyone involved. I had, I had so many films in my in my pool here that I really had to narrow it down to the movies that I love more than life itself. Like it took me months to get this down to uh, 10. Yeah, no, I know we've, yeah, we've been working on our eighties and seventies for a while. <laughs> and regrettably I had to cut <coughs> some carpenter. I didn't want to, but you had to kill your darlings. Hey, you do. You do. That's just, that's just the nature of the game. Well, um, so we knew my seven, Raising Arizona, and then Escape from is six. So you got to do your seven and six, right? Okay. All right, let's do it. Number seven is my all-time favorite musical, 1986's Little Shop of Horrors, <laughs> a remake of an old uh, Roger Corman film yeah. that stars uh, Rick Moranis, Ellen Green, Vincent Gardenia, Steve Martin, and Levi Stubbs. It's... One of the most fun films ever made. It's so hilarious. It's just this meek little guy who works in a plant shop who finds this plant from outer space that feeds on human flesh, and it kind of helps him get the girl. It's a very weird movie, but it is such a goddamn fun watch. It is so funny. The the songs are catchy. It's, yeah, it's hands down one of my all-time favorites. I hate that they're remaking it, but I think they're going to actually try, which is cool. I heard Chris Evans might be the dentist, which would be oh, fucking man. cool. That'd be great. But, I mean, that is <laughs> that is such a fun movie. Like I said, it's my favorite musical. I'm not usually one for musicals. Me neither. They're all t- they all tend to be kind of repetitive, except when you get weird with it. And movies like Sweeney Todd and A Little Shop of Horrors prove that you can get weird with it and still be entertaining. Yeah, I'm not too into, like, all of a sudden, 20 students at a high school are, like, breaking into dance like Grease. That's not, that is not for me. Yeah. But, yeah, I agree with you. If it has a little... If you got a big old Venus flytrap from outer space singing, I'm a mean green mother from outer space, and I'm bad, I'm in. Yeah, 100%. there you go. There you go. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> so much fun. I watched recently the... Uh, the director's cut that has a different ending, which is so fucking bleak. Interesting. The plant wins. It eats Seymour and takes over the world. What? <laughs> That's pretty great. And there's a song they cut from the end where you see these giant 300 foot Audrey twos devouring major cities. Jesus. It was such an ambitious do you have ending. This? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Can I borrow it? Sure. I haven't seen it in a while. And, and actually you've met Grant. It's like one of his favorite movies of all time. I'll kick ass. So I don't think he's seen that. So I'd love to borrow that. It's fucking bleak. In fact, yeah. test audiences are like, no way. Don't do that, man. <laughs> it's supposed to be a musical. This thing has to lose. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. I prefer the original ending, but cool that they have that. <laughs> yeah. I, I love shit like that. <laughs> and what's your number six? My number six. I am. I'm sensing some overlap. It's one of the most. Oh, damn it. Revered horror films of all time, 1980s The Shining. Yeah, yep. I have that. I figured you would. At my number one. I apologize <laughs> for stealing your thunder. No, I knew. I, we knew this would happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'll talk about it later. You yeah. go ahead. Man. Okay. So, The Shining is the only film we've done twice. And there's a reason for that. It is... What's the best horror movie of all time? It's one. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it can be considered the best horror film of all time. It's atmospheric, it's well-acted, it's creepy, it's unsettling, it's everything. It's, a lot of people consider it to be Kubrick's masterpiece, and Jack Nicholson's greatest performance, quite possibly, and still holds up to this day. It's mind-blowing when I find out people haven't seen it. It's one of those movies. Uh, Mind-blowing, yeah. Yeah. We said it uh, in our recent episode, our one-year anniversary episode, that people who don't like horror movies, they like The Shining. It's the kind of movie that... Because it's a good movie. Yeah, yeah, it's a good movie. It hinges upon its brilliant, brilliant filmmaking and brilliant, brilliant performances before the scares. Yeah. And then the scares are just an awesome fucking bonus. Yes. Jesus Christ. Hands down, man. Well said. Yeah, so I, I, you're going to... 
Yeah, it's my number one. You're gonna yeah. say your 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 two cents later. Yeah, we we've, we've talked about it so much on here. Yeah, it's like it comes they, up a lot. Well, and the people know, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that that'd be those are your six. So we're down to five. All right, it's moving right along. Um, I don't think you've seen this one yet, okay. which needs to change very soon. It'd be 1989, the movie that should have won Best Picture, but wasn't even fucking nominated. Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee. Oh. Spike Lee's second film, uh, his masterpiece still, undoubtedly his best movie. Uh, I've seen almost all of them now, and he has never come close to the brilliance of Do the Right Thing. Um, it's a day in the life in Brooklyn, and he's the star of the movie as well. You got John Turturro, you got you know John Carlo Esposito, just awesome actors you know from the eighties and are still awesome actors now. And it's a very simple, cut and dry movie. Again, about a day in the life in Brooklyn. Oh, Samuel L. Jackson's in it, too. That's, that's fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, Do the Right Thing. There's nothing to say about it if you haven't seen it. I think it's one of those movies that's just, it's just a, like an experiment. Experience, sorry. I don't even know what I would compare it to. Um, but it is so, so fucking important for people to see it. And Spike knows that, obviously. He's very aware of like, what his movies mean to, to the black community and to people in general. Um, this movie is like an easy 10 out of 10. I, you, you gotta see it, man. You really do. You're going to fall in love and you're gonna be like, dude, what the fuck? Like, well, what other Spike Lee movies come near this? And you're like, well, that's it, man. <laughs> it's all downhill from there. No, I, I love some of those movies. This is it, man. Do the right thing. Cannot believe it wasn't nominated for, that's, that's ridiculous. Like, that's absurd. Um, you know, that you're famously driving Miss Daisy one and is forever going to be looked at as just the most like bullshit pick over the this obvious movie that was like, could change America, you know? And that's, isn't that what movies are for? Just to change people and help people grow and, uh, you know, learn. So, yeah, do the right thing. I, I, it, it literally is day in the life of Brooklyn. You just gotta watch it. I don't know what else to tell you. Performances are amazing. The writing is amazing. Yeah, just watch it, dude. Okay. Uh, you know, I'll be sure I, to do that. I, I, it's one of those, it's like, why haven't more people seen it? What's going on? Why? Because Tom Hanks is in it, you know? Because it's from the 80s and there's no, like, star? Come on. Watch that shit, man. It's awesome. I, uh, you know, I, I, I'll let you borrow it or whatever. If you, I don't know if it's on anything right now, but yeah, I just people have got to see that movie. All, all people, you know, every it's very important for any American because it's not just about you got you got like Italian characters in there. You know, they own a pizza shop, right? That's where Spike Lee works. It's just God, oh man, yeah. I, I could go on and on, but then I explain the whole movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's one of those. It'd be like trying to talk about like Boyhood. Like, okay. well, it just kind of happens, you know? Yeah. This shit just goes down, you know, like. Let's do the right thing. It's just a day. It's like days confused, but real, you know, hmm. you know? Yeah, definitely check it out, man. I, lo- I-, I love do the right thing. Okay. And it-, it-, it introduced me to Spike Lee and I was like, yeah, this guy's got a lot of shit to say, man, you know, and still does. I love the Black Klansman. I thought that's one of his better, like five or six movies, you know, um, but you do the right thing is undoubtedly his masterpiece. No doubt. Killer. Well, after hearing how passionately you defend it, I'll definitely have to check that out. Yes. <laughs> killer and that was your number five yes okay my number five is a film i have been wanting to talk about for a very long time on the podcast but we have not yet done it and now that it's randomized it's gonna be a while probably but this is my chance the greatest vampire movie ever made 1985's fright night yes (laughs) not a very revered film no the most part this is kind of a personal pick i think it's brilliant i think it's scary i think it's one of the best, like I said, the best vampire movie ever made. It's very simple. Teenage kid finds out his next door neighbor's a vampire and is killing prostitutes. And so he takes it upon himself to deal with this. But vampire finds out he's onto him and it's a cat and mouse game between these two characters. And Chris Sarandon plays Jerry Dandridge, the most frightening motherfucking vampire, like modern day Dracula ever. So cool. He's got these we- creepy fingernails. Yeah, yeah. It's the way he's always eating apples. It's so cool. He's such a suave monster. And the makeup effects are incredible. You've got these really cool transformation sequences into bats and wolves. Yeah, yeah. The vampire hunter Peter Vincent is Peter Cushing and Vincent Price combined. Unbelievable. Played by Roddy McDowell. It's just... That's genius. It's such a... It's a horror fan's, you know, wet dream. So <laughs> I was about fun. to say, yeah, say it's, it, man. It's fucking great. <laughs> And I just, I wish more people knew about this one. It's actually really tough to get mm-hmm. in the States. I, it's, it took me a long time to, yeah. to find that one. Because I remember reading, like, oh, this is like one of the essential, like, for horror fans. Yeah. And I was, man, it's fucking hard to find. I only bought, I only managed to buy it recently, like, in the past couple I found weeks. it. I found it in Austin. I, like, drove to Austin one day, like, finding movies. And I, I found it there. And I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> it's great. 
it's such a fantastic movie. I wish it had more of uh, more of an audience here. Yeah, it was remade in 2011 with uh, Anton Yelchin and Colin. Farrell. I never saw that. It was actually not bad. Yeah, I was. I mean, I love both of them. Yeah, yeah rest in peace, Anton. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to like it, but it was it was pretty good. David Tennant, Tony Collette. Like, wait, what? I didn't know Tony Collette was in it. Yeah, she's oh. his mom. Oh, there you go. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, very good movie. And uh, but the original has no equal. Is yeah, one of my all time favorite horror films. I cannot wait to do it on the podcast. And uh, enough said. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> oh boy, we're down to our top fours here. Getting down to the nitty gritty. And we know your two, we know my one. <laughs> my number four, I don't think you'll have either, but uh, it's also from 1989. It's hard to choose between do the right thing and this, but um, oh, this yeah. movie hits me a little harder because I love writing, I love reading, I love poem, poetry, and I love Robin Williams. So it's Peter Weir's Dead Poet Society. Ugh. Um, you know, Ethan Hawke. I just like cry every time he is spun around by Robin Williams and is forced to, you know, get creative and be artistic. That movie, ooh, man. Um, it's gonna be it's hard it's hard to like go there, you know. It's one of those movies I almost don't want to watch because I know how much it's gonna shred me. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, seize the day. And now that Robin Williams has passed away, it's even tougher. Um, bru- brutal scenes in this movie. Obviously, the the suicide is horrible. Something you just don't want to ever see in a movie, but it it's kind of like necessary for this movie, right? The story arc of it, what's going on with these kids and how they're learning and growing artistically and their parents have this plan set up for them. You know, this is what you're going to do. You're going to become a doctor, this and that. It's just yeah. horse shit, you know? Horse shit. Kids, kids should be allowed to fucking make their own decisions, you know, and figure out things their own way. Uh, we're only there to guide them. But this movie shows how like one man, Keating, can almost like infiltrate a really nice school and give these kids some fucking freedom, you know? And that's what I, oh man, I dropped out when I was a sophomore because I, I couldn't, no one, no one could like figure me out. You know, I was failing like every class when I dropped out, like I was horrible in school. I was always getting in trouble. So it's like, man, I wish I had a teacher who would have fucking cared, you know, or reached out to me or been like, Hey man, I think maybe this is a better way for you to learn. You just always know, like I just failed everything, man. I was like, I had like a, 50 something in physics when I dropped out, you know, I was horrible in school. Um, and so this movie, yeah, this movie's very powerful, extremely powerful. I, I, I don't know what else to say about it <laughs> or I'll start crying. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, a, it's my favorite Rob Williams performance too. You know, of course I love Jeannie. I love good morning Vietnam. You know, this is the one that just, just like touches my heart so tenderly, but so like hard at the same time, you know, it's an awesome movie. I understand. It's a powerful movie. I've only seen it once, but once is enough, man. It spoke to me, man. And yeah. I, I bought it recently. I found it at a discount, so I figured, why not? It's one of those films I probably would want to watch again. For sure, I should have. And it did speak to me. It, it hurt. It's a film that hurt. I was not expecting that hurt, but <clears throat> it's such a solid, dramatic experience. Yes. And I, I think that's the film that should have taken Best Picture in '89. I would not have a problem with that either, but you haven't seen the right thing yet, that's so true. you might change your mind. They're both stellar. I mean, yeah, this is like, that's such a hard year for me. I, I made a top five for that year yeah. uh, last year because I was doing all the nines, you know, in 1989. And I had the, yeah, I had that one too, you know, Dead Poets and Do the Right Thing. I'm willing to admit that Do the Right Thing might be a better overall movie, but Dead Poets just has that. It's for me, you know, it's about, it's well, about I think, like, it's like finding yourself through reading and writing, you know? Well, like you said, you know, after Robin Williams' suicide, mm-hmm. all of his movies became a lot more poignant. They just escalate to a whole. And after, when he died, I did, I finally watched Dead Poet Society, Good Morning Vietnam, and Good Will Hunting. And that trifecta, it destroyed me. I don't know how you did that. All three. You hadn't seen them yet? They were all three of the first time watches. Oh. And it, it annihilated me emotionally. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My, my old, my older brother Jeremy is always huge into him, you know? So he owned, when I was like, I saw like Fisher King when I was like 14, you know, I saw that I, and you know, and then yeah, then came Good Morning Vietnam and then Dead Poets. So it was like one of the first actors I fell in love with. And this, yeah, this will always be the movie. Yeah, I mean, just the Carpe Diem, Seize the Day Boys, you know, like mm. ripping pages out of the book, you know. Ah, yeah, I just get chills and start crying, everything. It just, all the emotions, you know, come up. And that's sometimes what I want from a movie. That's why it's at my number four. Well said, man. Well said. 
My number four is another cult hit that I think has a much wider audience than a lot of the films on my list. Uh, 1987's The Princess Bride. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Maybe the best fantasy comedy ever made. And still to this day, a fun watch. One of the best love stories ever Yes, made. yeah. Robin Wright, Carrie Elwes, Mandy Patinkin, Wallace Shawn, Andre the Giant. Yes. Chris Sarandon again. He pops up a lot here. <laughs> Just Christopher Guest. Come on. Billy Crystal. Yeah. It never ends. It's such a fun movie. And it's just, it's, you know, it's just true love. It's true love conquers all. And you've got some unbelievable characters. You've got incredible dialogue. You've got, I mean, Andre the Giant alone as Fezzik. Come it's on. Just, it's so heartwarming. It's a film that makes you feel good when you watch it. It makes you laugh. You know it's going to be okay. You know it's going to be, you know, this is going to end the right way despite all the teases. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I love that movie to death. I, I, I'm due for a rewatch myself for uh, sure. The Princess it's a, Bride. It's been a while. <laughs> so goddamn funny. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I love Ron Wright, man. Me too. She's great. She's like just been in like my life for a long time without me really knowing it. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. So, top threes. Top three. Um. So we already know my one is The Shining, and you know your two is Raiders. Okay. Uh, my number three is also a Stanley Kubrick film and be 1987's Full Metal Jacket. Oh, killer. Um, one of the best horror movies of all time, for sure. Obviously a different take on it. Yeah. Um, I would say the first hour is like my favorite where you have... Bah, bah! <laughs> this is my rifle. Without my rifle, I'm useless. Without me, my rifle is useless. All that stuff. Yeah, I can watch it in like over and over and over and over and over. And then the like finale of the movie is just fucking epic and turns into this full blown like war movie. It is it's breathtaking. I, I put it right up there with like Bastards, where it's just like this unique sort of war film that just kind of twists a little bit, makes it just that much more entertaining. You know, it gives it that punch. And uh Stanley Kubrick obviously tackled a lot of different things. And it just makes sense that he was able to make a war movie with no fucking problem, you know? Uh yeah, I love full metal. Um yeah, Stanley Kubrick's always gonna come up a lot. Yeah. One of the best directors, uh, that I know of, and yeah, Full Metal. I've seen it so many goddamn times. Well, I think it's the, one of the first movies I reviewed for Film Guys. It was. As well. I remember that. Yeah, I give it a ten. Yeah. The beauty of Full Metal Jacket is it's. I think it's the only film of its kind where you follow a certain group of characters from boot. To, yeah. To yeah, yeah. 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 And that's why I think you get endeared to these people because you see their whole journey yes. from you know civilian to citizen to, to quote Starship Troopers, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's just yeah. It's a it's a remarkable film. It's one of his best, if you can. I mean, if you can say that, <laughs> it's so hard because, like, in my mind, I'm like, all right, you know, obviously, The Shining, this, you know, and I love some of his stuff from the '70s, but then you go back to like, you know, the ki- the Killing and uh, '60s with Strange Love. It's just like, man, it adds up, and then you're like, oh, all of a sudden, I have a list of ten movies that I I love all of them. You know, that's yeah, that's a sign of a good director. Oh yeah, opinion, in my opinion, big <laughs> time. Full Metal Jacket. That's a good one. Yeah, awesome Very movie. Good. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget. It was one of the first reviews I did, and I was watching it at home, and I was just like, yeah, I'm going to give this a 10. It needs to be on the website. <laughs> I love, 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 love Full Metal Jacket. That's awesome, man. Oh, so cool. My, my number three is another comedy, a fantastic, celebrated comedy, 1984's Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, Sigourney Weaver, Rick Moranis, and Ernie Hudson. Enough said. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, it's a film that has lasted so long, outlived its completely unnecessary and shitty reboot, and is due for another sequel this year by uh, Jason Reitman. Well, it was this year. I don't know if that's still happening. Yeah. But um, Ghostbusters is timeless. It's hilarious. And it's... It stands on its own as maybe the best film of everyone involved's career. <laughs> I love it to death. And it's actually kind of spooky. There's some scenes in there that are creepy. Very. And I love the whole idea of, you know, the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Like, how, how did that work? How did they make that? How did they sell that? <laughs> I mean, the bad guy at the end is this giant, like, 200-foot marshmallow. How do, you, <laughs> how do you sell that to anybody? That is amazing. <laughs> 
The effects actually look fairly decent <coughs> still to this day. Yeah. The camaraderie between the guys is flawless. And it's, yeah, I mean, it, you know, got a killer theme song. And it's one of my constants. It's in my top ten of all time. Hell yeah. <laughs> Understandably. See, there's a lot in this list that are in my top ten of all time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the 80s, 80s is a powerful decade for you. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, man. Well, I think you know what's coming. Yes. Yes, I do. My number two. 1982. John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, The Thing. So, one of the first times Connor and I ever talked <laughs> was when we worked at Draft House together and we were talking about movies and talking about horror movies and I was like, yeah, I love horror, you know. But then I admitted to him that I hadn't seen The Thing. John Carpenter's maybe his best movie. Maybe. It's hard. Uh, next decade, we have, we'll have a movie to say something about that. Um, but The Thing is the best movie that you have recommended to me. Yeah. <laughs> it is a unquestioned 10 out of 10 across the fucking board entertainment value fucking through the roof <laughs> if you thought yeah if you thought i'd loved escape from new york i mean the thing is like oh it's like on all the drugs you know it's like on crack steroids you know it's on everything everything all at the same time oh it's so it's so good it, it, like i when i'm watching it i'm like i know like my girlfriend hates it <laughs> and i'm just like ah yeah but i'm just fucking injecting me with that shit you know I yeah I love the thing. Thank you. I've only known it for like two years, but it it's not, that's that damn good. It is that damn good. I'm shocked you don't I have it. <laughs> like shocked because when I was making my list, I was like, man, I, I wonder if I wonder if he has the thing as high as I do. <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't thinking you wouldn't have it at all. <laughs> okay, but that's no. That's the '80s, man. Yeah. Uh, the, the difference between you and I with the '80s is a lot of these movies you grew up with and have grown with for years. A lot of these movies I've found later on in life you know? so i had my list at 13 for months the three and the thing and escape from new york were both on there no escape from new york wasn't okay but the thing the thing was there predator was there okay and who framed roger rabbit was i there. knew you loved that one that's why you're yeah. very yeah yeah i had to shave it down to 10 and i really had to question myself like what do you love more the thing or fright night really was the two i was bouncing it back and forth and i just had to go with fright night it just for, i don't know what it is about that movie it's the the music it's, it's the fair, characters. Man. It just speaks to me more than the thing does. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's just it's just crazy how, like, you you have a passion for something, right? Yeah. And you share it with me, and my passion somehow surpasses is <laughs> is is what it's beautiful. Yeah. It's fucking awesome. Just like if I like I remember when I gave you like go see Hereditary. And you're like, thank you, dude. Like, <laughs> that's the that's the shit we live for, man. It's like, here, you might like this, man. So check it out. And then you're like, oh my god, I love it. You know? Yeah. That's what it's all about. Fuck yeah. But but again, I don't have the same. Yeah, our, our lists are very different. I love this. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so your two is Raiders. My number two is Raiders. My one's The Shining. We know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't think it's Jack Nicholson's best performance. We'll talk about that in the 70s. Well, I just meant in general, like some people think. That. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I consider that either. It's hard. It's really yeah. hard, but it's in the top three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on, yeah, it's one of those, nothing can like parallel it. There's nothing as weird or as good as it. I like, I adore things that are completely off the wall. Like, like I'm a huge fan of David Lynch. You know, I love Twin Peaks and Mohan Drive and Eraserhead movies like that, shows like that that are, don't have much rhyme or reason and the shining sometimes feels that way <laughs> um in particular you know the finale it's just madness it's just fucking chaos and i there's nothing more that i love in movies than than chaos and confusion and forcing you to watch the screen you know that's isn't that like a really cool feeling where you're like i can't leave uh, i might miss something oh it's phenomenal and the shining does that still <laughs> still how many times have you seen this movie 50? 100? The best horror movies trap you along with the characters. Yeah. Oh, my God. And The Shining, again, it, there's stuff in it. I mean, I could talk about it for... I mean, we have. We've talked about it for hours. <laughs> and I, I still, like, I don't think I've ever brought up how, like, one of my favorite things in the whole movie is one time Danny's watching TV and the TV's not plugged in. Oh, my God. Um, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite things is how... <laughs> When you're in the office at the beginning of the movie with Ullman, there's no way he has a window in that office. It's just impossible <laughs> with the way the building works. When he walks in, you're like, that's what? How is that the best? <laughs> and there's just, ah, oh, there's endless stuff. At the beginning of the movie, you see Stanley Kubrick's face in the clouds. Oh, 
Genius filmmaking. Genius. One Razzies. People didn't know what the fuck they were watching when it came out. Sometimes, we talked about this with Carpenter with your Uncle Sean. Sometimes it takes a little while for people to understand what's greatness. Yeah. And The Shining is greatness, and it took a while for people to understand. But but once they did, it didn't stop. It plays on TV, you know? It, people have it on DVD fucking everywhere. I see it still at Target for like $5, you know? It is never going to leave. Surely it's never going to leave Filmgasm. We will talk about it forever. <laughs> I mean, it hit, it's hitting its 40th you know, anniversary this year. We Like you said, we, it's the only movie we've done twice um, as our anniversary, our one-year anniversary movie. Yeah, it's just it's endlessly entertaining. Endlessly, there's conversations you're going to have about it because there's all these theories. There's all these different things that are going on. All the performances are fucking wonderful. And you got someone who like went insane after the movie. Yeah. And you got Jack Nicholson who just kept going and kept being a fucking dominant actor and ended up playing the Joker nine <laughs> years later. And you got, you know, little Danny who didn't really act again, you know. Just wild stuff. Wild, wild stuff. Uh, pop culture icon, of course, you know. And uh, I, I just find it funny that it's like came out in 1980. You know, it started off the 80s and it's my favorite. It always will be my favorite. I don't see how a movie could pass it. <laughs> I would have to see it so many times, you know, like. I love The Thing to Death, but it's not even close to The Shining. Like, there's such a huge gap between one and two that's not even fucking funny, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, w- without further ado, let's, oh. let's hear your one. I think I know what it is. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> let's hear it. Number one film of the 80s, the undisputed greatest film to ever come out of the 80s, my all-time favorite movie ever made, 1985's Back to the Future. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Hitting its 35th anniversary oh, this yeah. summer, and we're going to do a giant fucking episode on it. Oh, without a doubt. I've been waiting for this for years to talk about this movie to anybody who will fucking listen, and that's what you guys are, so buckle up. <laughs> Back to the Future has been my favorite movie my entire life. It's the earliest movie I can remember watching. I have adored it literally as long as I've been alive. <laughs> I have posters of it all over my apartment. Yeah. I have like eight or nine t-shirts. It's the god of movies. I love Back to the Future so much. It is everything. It is hilarious. It has great dramatic stakes. It has emotional resonance. It has memorable characters. It's unbelievable. It's got two incredible sequels. It, yes. Yeah, why are those not in your top ten? Ugh, I, I don't know. You didn't want to include <laughs> like multiple from the same... I. That's hard. I know yeah. that's hard. I wanted to. I wanted to share the wealth yeah. a little bit. But if you're being honest with yourself, if I'm being would honest two with and myself, three both be in there? Three, not. I wouldn't because it's in 1990. That oh, there, a, there yeah. you go. And isn't isn't the third one? I haven't seen it in a long time. That one's more focused on, um, homeboy, uh, Doc, right? Three, yeah, three. You get to see Doc fall in love. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And it's in the. I don't remember list. that one very well. Yeah, it's they're all three fucking great. Oh I yeah, mean, I remember <laughs> the first two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, this movie. For those of you who don't know, uh, Marty McFly is this teenage. Uh, aspiring guitarist he's kind of unsure of himself his best friend is this scientist named Doc Brown not really sure how they became friends skip it doesn't matter <laughs> and Doc has built a time machine out of a DeLorean and Marty ends up accidentally going back in time to the 50s in this DeLorean and screws up his parents first meeting and endangers his own existence so he recruits the help of 1950s Doc to help him fix the time machine fix his parents relationship and save his own existence and get himself back to the future. And Crazy. I have seen it maybe I've well over a thousand times. And Jesus. I will watch it again tonight and love it just as much as I did the first time. It is the absolute undisputed king of my movie love. Yeah. And that'll never change. That's so cool. I can't say I feel that way about a movie. That's so cool. That is so cool. I just saw it in uh, a live. It was a. Yeah, it's your cousin, with, right? With, a, with my cousin. It was a live orchestra doing the score. And then you, the movie was on the screen. And it was so much fun to watch this movie in a sea of Back to the Future lovers. People were cheering at certain times in the movie. It was so cool. That's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I couldn't speak enough. I cannot wait to do that episode. Oh, yeah. July. <laughs> July. Connor oh, will tell. I'm going to dominate that <laughs> shit. I can't wait. I'll probably just sit back and like, smoke a cigarette. You know, <laughs> let you do your thing, man. <laughs> I don't think I'll need to speak. <laughs> oh, man. Back to the Future. Mm. Perfect movie. Yeah. The hell perfect yeah. movie. And the, 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 remind me, the second one came out in 1989? Yes. Okay. Wow. So that's a big 85, 89, 90. That's yeah. an interesting. Well, they filmed two and three back to back. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. They knew what they had. They're like, all right, oh, yeah, we got some fucking gold here. Well, let's Michael use J- these two fuckers while we can. You know? Well, Michael J. Fox was also making family ties at the time. 
Oh. So he had a very sporadic schedule. They had hired Eric Stoltz to play wow. Parting Fight and filmed a chunk of the movie. With I him. didn't know that. But it wasn't working out. Zemeckis said, like, I know you're just not clicking, mm-hmm. which has got to suck for Eric Stoltz. I mean, he didn't no do kidding. anything wrong. No kidding, man. But uh, eventually they worked out a deal with the producers of Family Ties to have Michael J. Fox film that at night and then okay. film Back to the Future during the day. And it worked out. because Busy man. It, it, Back to the Future does not work without Michael J. Fox. His yeah. chemistry with Christopher Lloyd is what makes that movie... So timeless. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, shit just worked out the way it was supposed to for that film. And that's, that's, you get lucky. Like, movies, you have to get lucky. You do. You have to get lucky. Like, there's there's so many movies that just slip under the cracks or, or become, like, cult movies because they just didn't, they just weren't lucky. But Back to the Future, everything worked Clicked, out yeah. the way it was, and now it's one of the most celebrated films of all time. Well, it just fucking defines, like, when you think of 1985. The like, middle, right like, in the yeah, smack back to the middle future, of the 80s. And you, you just think of 80s, yeah, and Back to the Future is, like, right at the top of that list as far as, like, pop culture goes, for sure. Oh, Great dude. pick. I knew it all along. Yeah. You knew my one all it along. It was no secret here. <laughs> I am, I, I am, I'm still, like, what are you most shocked by on my list? I was not expecting Amadeus. And I'm still blown away that you don't have the thing. But everything else makes sense, yeah. Everything else makes sense, man. Fuck yeah, man. So what were some films that you ended up having to cut? Sophie's Choice was my number 11. Sophie's Choice? That's the best female performance probably I've ever seen. Meryl Streep is wow. just fucking lights out in that movie. Uh, it was really hard to not choose that. I've only seen it twice, and I think maybe I need to see it again um, to, 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 really, to really have that connection to it. And then, uh, and then Blue Velvet. Blue, Blue Velvet was Velvet. very hard to cut. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't. I mean, this list is good. You know, my ten is Raiders. You know, um, that's what I was looking at, and I was like, I love Blue Velvet to death, but this is like, I literally think this is his third. And Spielberg's one of the best ever. I think this is just like in his top five, no doubt. And I, I just, I felt very strongly about having Indiana Jones in there. So I had to cut. You know, you have to kill your darlings, man. What, what about you? Obviously, you had I those had, three that were for you know. Yeah, I had the Thing, Predator, and Roger Rabbit. Were I defend? And then Back to the Future Two. Back to the Future Two. I was considering the Terminator. Yeah. Uh, Poltergeist. I considered that. Oh yeah. I thought about that one too. Door Poltergeist. Uh, I know Um, big, I know some of our other film guys with tributers were probably expecting like the lost boys, but eh, not really for me. Stand by me. Uh, Uh, the birds. That's the one I thought about for a long ass time. That was was a tough one to cut. And I was like, all right, Austin, (laughs) be honest with yourself, man. Do you really like the birds better than Scarface? (laughs) No. <laughs> the Fly. I it, thought about The Fly yeah. for a while, too. I, I had, like, an initial list of, like, 25. That's what I usually do. And then I, like, make obvious cuts. Yeah. And then I make the tough cuts. And I'm like, fuck, I got 12 still, you know? <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah. It's Empire fun. Strikes Back, I was toying with. Yeah, see, I don't but I've, like Star Wars. So. I don't know. I've lost a lot of... I lost a lot of the flavor with Star Wars. Well, like you said, I mean, why would you choose that over Indiana Jones? Exactly. What are you fucking thinking? I will yeah. watch... The indie trilogy way before I watch any Star Wars. Any, yeah. I've always been that way. Yeah. I was never really ever into Star Wars. Like, I, yeah, I know. Um, so you know, those are really easy to like kick out. The thing is, though, I grew up with both at the same time, and I still feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. No, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Indiana Jones is just, yeah, it's yeah. one of the best trilogies ever, man. That 80s trilogy is pristine, you know. I'm surprised you, I, I was expecting uh, Tim Burton's Batman. <sighs> yeah, I thought about. I, I did think about that, and for the '90s, I thought about Batman Returns when we did that. Yeah, I, you you know me, I'm I'm more partial to to, to the drama and mm-hmm. and intense violence and stuff than 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 those kind of films. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like like Dead Poets is one that's just like yeah, it's so far up my alley. It's got to be there, you know. Do the right thing. I love movies that are, take place in like one day. Yeah, I've always been obsessed with Days Confused, Slacker, and then yeah, this is just same kind of shit, you know. Right on, man. I think, yeah, it was a very interesting uh, eye-opener for yeah. both of us on this one. Well, let's go through them again. You know, we usually okay. do that. So my number 10 is Raiders of the Lost Ark, 1981. Scarface, 1983. Amadeus, 84. Raising Arizona, 87. Number six, Escape from New York, 1981. Do the Right Thing, 89. Dead Poet Society, 89. Number three, Full Metal Jacket, 1987. Number two, The Thing, 1982. And number one, The Shining, 1980. All right. Very well done. My number 10, Beetlejuice. Number nine, Raising Arizona. Number eight, An American Werewolf in London. Number seven, Little Shop of Horrors. Number six, The Shining. Number five, Fright Night. Number four, The Princess Bride. Number three, Ghostbusters. Number two, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Number one, Back to the Future. 
Bang. I will stand by that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fuck always, yeah. always open to watching new movies, but yeah, it's gonna be hard to break that 10. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a pretty definitive 10. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, that was fun, man. I had, a, I had a blast with that. The eighties are, yeah, some great shit in there, man. Yeah. The eighties are my decade. Yeah. That was where Connor, the movie fan was born. Well, yeah. All that classic American stuff that just right for you. Not so cool. Doubt. So cool. Oh, well, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope this filled your Sunday blues. God knows there's a lot of that going around right now. And uh, stay tuned. We'll be doing the 70s very soon, yeah. the next couple weeks. And uh, until then, you know, we'll also have the random uh, anniversary movie coming out on Sundays. We'll have our weeklies. We'll have our Fridays. Yeah. We're not going anywhere. Oh, yeah. Tuesday, Tuesday, Friday, yeah. Sunday, from here on out, pretty much all the time. There will yeah. be no disruption in yeah. scheduling. We'll always have... Pretty much three episodes for you for the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah that's it, happening. Yeah. So, that's yeah. happening with all this bullshit going on and everybody's trying to, you know, just like find some positivity and some peace. We'll help as much as we can. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and per, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest, it helps me. Yeah. It helps me get through the day knowing like, oh, I can go talk about movies, you know, um, even if that's kind of silly. I don't care. If it's, just one person listens to this and feels a little bit better about what's going on, that means the world. Yeah, I, I, my favorite thing, if I were listening to this, I'd be making my list right along. Like, exactly. Where the fuck is that? You know, Make you know? your list. Yeah. And send it to us if you want. Share I, your list. I love seeing yeah. people's, seeing someone's top 10 of anything. I don't have to meet you. I already know a lot about you. Yeah, man. I love that shit. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, yeah. Definitely, definitely if you're listening, man. Yeah. Dude, you know, you can send us a top five. I don't care. Just do whatever you want, man. We're we like open to anything, you know? Without a doubt. We, we want more communication if possible with, with any film guys and fans out there. For sure. And, you know, we have, we're on all the social media. We're, we monitor that constantly. You can email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. And, uh, I think this week, I don't know what we're going to have for you this week. We don't. No idea. <laughs> we no don't know idea. when this is going out. Yeah, because we're, we're recording this on, what is it, the 22nd, March yeah. 22nd? Yeah, I have no idea. Because we're, <laughs> we're releasing Tommy Boy today. Yes. Yeah. And so who knows? Where yeah. we, who knows where we are in time right now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I know it's going to kick ass. I know we're going to try our best. And even if the movie sucks, we're going to make it entertaining. So, yes. You know, keep on listening and keep on trucking, you know, stay positive out there. Yeah. Definitely. I think it definitely helps if there's good energy, you know, without a doubt. Keep it flowing. And thanks for listening once again. Peace. Mm-hmm.